All right, everybody, welcome to episode 221 of the Art and Chicken Do America podcast. I'm your host in the place to be, Mr. Jacob P. And sitting right in front of me is the brown recluse, Mr. Art Trail. Art, say hello to the millions. The millions. Hey, what's up, guys? Guys, it's early morning still for me, but guys, go to kmancoffee.com. Check out their entire inventory. They got coffee beans. They got the hibiscus tea. They got the cacao butter. They got anything you might need. They got sweatpants. They got hats. They got shirts. Uh, I'm sure some kind of holiday is coming up where you need to purchase something for someone. I think Halloween's on. Halloween's way. coming up. Get someone a Halloween present. Um, uh, order it now. Uh, and coffee, you know, coffee. If you don't drink coffee, man, that's insane. But um, what kind of uh, ISIS serial killer kind of, are you? Yeah, what kind of, I was gonna say ice truck killer from the from a texter, but anyways, um, guys, go to Caveman Coffee, check out their entire inventory, type in America at checkout to receive fifteen percent off. Tell them Martin Jacob sent you. Take a picture of yourself drinking the coffee. Tag us, tag them. We appreciate it. They appreciate it. And guys, speaking of sponsors, guys, make sure you check out our other sponsor, guys, the great, the powerful. She might be flavorful. Well, I don't know yet. She's in <laughs> South Africa. I haven't had the opportunity to partake. But anyways, guys, make sure you check out SukerApparel.com. Apparel store for the great and powerful Nicole Smith Bosch. Go over there. Check out all of her merch. She's got some new shirts that are popping over there. My favorite one is the Witchy Kitty t-shirt, which you guys should all be checking out. Or that Tiger Belly t-shirt. That one's bomb as fuck, too. But go over there. Check out all of her merch. Enter promo code Art Jacob, and she'll give you 10% off your entire purchase. But, guys, we are not here to talk about Caveman Coffee or the very delicious Nicole Smith Bosch. Guys, we are here to have a beautiful discussion with another amazing guest art do you want to go ahead and introduce our amazing guest today guys um musician cancer survivor Mm -hmm. inspirational person uh all around badass uh, mustache uh we were just talking about how your instagram is in our top five favorite instagrams to follow because it's uh you post some uh pretty dank memes on there Uh, (laughs) uh mr michael crane you might know him from dead crosses cunts uh i was as i was telling before we started recording i was telling you guys that uh my mom loves the uh cunts album cover this is where jacob will put a picture of the cunts album cover for the uh, youtube here for everyone to 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 look at my my mom loves your artwork so uh thank you for coming on yeah yeah thanks for having me um a couple of things that I wanted to talk about just because I, I did want to talk about some of your musical projects before we get into like the meat and potatoes of, the, of this episode. Um, Cause we want to talk some, some CZ top down the line, but um, we had Justin on, on here early on in this podcast uh, history. So we, we've had some, we had some, uh, some run-ins with, with, with your bandmates in the past and it, um, I, I wish uh, I wish it would have. We were so like early on in in that um, in like the interview process that we were very like, oh, so what's your favorite kind of ice cream or whatever. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do want to ask a couple because I think the last time we talked to him, he talked about how there was like new Dead Crosses in the works. I know that there's a new Cunts album like in the works, right? If I am reading the social medias correct, I, I know yeah. that there was like we we start we started writing, but um we're all in multiple bands together yeah like and so um me and matt and kevin have another new band called mop buckets which is more like surfy rudimentary peni it's really fun so that kind of took precedence we had to finish this ep where we got one song left to track guitar and vocals on um and that is scheduled for release already. So we kind of, you kind of have to prioritize, right? Like when you're in multiple projects. So that we were like, all right, shit, let's, let's get that going. You know, we got to get that off so it can be pressed. And then uh, Cowards, then Matt and I are also in a band called Cowards. And we have two songs left to mix. So it's 10 songs, tracked, everything. And I'm mixing the last two today. So like things kind of, you know, get put on hold. You're like, okay, well, let's, let's get this thing done. And then we'll go back to that. But yeah, uh, Cunts is playing on the 29th of August. Um, I think it's some illegal show, you know, (laughs) it's by the ravine or, you know, I don't know, by, by the LA river or something, but nice, but we are, 
yeah we, we've been writing we have so much material we just it's just when when we can get to it or not is that you said it's an illegal show is that it seems you guys are very tied into like the 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 la vibe of like the way shows are put together and then these uh, do it yourself type setup things like that even with even when you guys opened up for for the melvins i was like dude this feels like so fucking like raw like you guys just showed up with like uh pantyhoses on your heads and like yeah. it was like yeah. dude this this just this, there was a like a certain like element of danger that you could see these guys like play in a garage or something like that like mm -hmm. for like four people or something and it just it felt exciting like um is that all because of that, like that vibe is that, you know, we talked to Justin and he was talking about the San Diego vibe of like, Oh, everything is like anything goes mixing cultures and everything. Is that similar to, you know, your musical upbringing? I think, um, I don't know if it's as much of a, a geographic factor as it is just a, maybe a generational factor. Um, rock and roll should be scary and dangerous and not correct in my opinion, like it's the same, it's art and art should push the boundaries and art should be questionable at times. I feel like, yeah, I mean, I don't want my fucking music to be safe. I don't want my art to be safe. When I say safe, I mean, not as in physically safe, like it's, it's unsafe to go to this show. Although back in the old days, it was, you know, several bands I saw changed my fucking life. And, and I'm sure Justin could have said the same thing. Um, I remember seeing early on, I saw, God, where do I start? You know, cows. I saw the cows probably in 95, 90, somewhere in mid nineties. And they were so terrifying and so fucked up. And it, it wasn't a show. Like they were really fucked up and sick dudes, but they were <laughs> incredible. And for me, that embraces the spirit of, I guess, what you would consider rock and roll, right? Like, it, like those early Kiss records. Like when I looked at them when I was a kid, I was like, "What the fuck? This is terrifying." Mm -hmm. but, oh my god, I want to know more. You know. And then back in, back in the, in those days, like in the late eighties, early nineties, I mean, I was born in 74. So I missed that, like the golden age of punk rock. I was too young still. I caught the tail end of it, mm -hmm. but those shows were so violent. Like it was a different world. I, I remember going to those shows and just being completely blown away by the music, but also the level of violence. Like there, it was fucking bloody. I saw horrendous shit happen at shows back in those days. And I, we still kept going, you know, it's like, this is, I don't know what is happening here, but this, this is amazing. I need to see more, you know? So for me, like, I don't want my art fucked with. You know, like I, I want art to be free and, and provoking at times, you know? So I guess to circle back to your question, like, like for cunts, obviously the name is like, mm. It's not going to get you <laughs> yeah, on many yeah. radio stations with that name. No, right? no. And it's, it's got, it's not gotten us a lot of shows too, mm -hmm. for sure certain venues and, and promoters are like, dude, you guys are so rad, but I can't do it right now. It's like, I get it. I totally you get, get it. to the hunt instead you, of the you, cunts? It's funny you say that because when I got those tickets to see the Melvins, I didn't even know you guys were on it. You guys weren't even promoted as one of the bands on there. And so when yep. we got there and I was like, oh, the cunts are playing here? I was like, <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, to and your that's point... Fine. To your point, like you were saying, like, you know, you don't want your art fucked with and that, you know, rock should be, you know, provoking or whatever. It, I've said this a million times on this podcast where it's just like true art. It should be a reflection of, you know, 
you know, human emotions or the human experience. Mm-hmm. And that's what rock and roll should be too. Like, I mean, yeah, like you can be all cartoonish with and like, ah, the devil, the devil, you know, six, six, six and all that bullshit or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. But like, there's a lot, there's a, there's a real underbelly to society that, you know, that rock and roll has always been good at like, you know, exposing and then pushing. And like, that's to me, like when I listen to something like, if it's like Nickelback, that just seems like, oh, this is like super like white collar, like rock and roll. Like somebody, you've said it before. This like is meant pack. to be played in the J.C. Penny like background music vibe or whatever. Correct. Yeah. Or you're like in an elevator of like a, a, a you know, department store. But like yeah. we're edgy because we, we sell ACDC t-shirts, which, you know, I'm not hating on ACDC at all. I love ACDC, but it's come to the you know, the corporate forefront where it's it's now safe. We're back like in the 70s. Like, oh, that was dangerous music. You know, Bon Scott, you know, yeah. his whole deal. But, well, like, you you, you got to progress. Drank, he drank himself to death. Correct, mm-hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, rock always has to progress. You know, even going back to, like, the 50s, just dancing, you know, shaking your hips. Like, that was super edgy because, you know, you know, the 40s, like, was very much like, you know, like, the movie Footloose. Like, dancing, like, provocatively could land you, like, in, in fucking jail, you know, in some yeah. places, in, you know, in the United States, which is crazy because you're supposed to be free. But I totally agree with that sentiment about, like, rock should always yeah. be dangerous, you know? Like, and, there should be an element of danger there. And it's important to note, too, that people have a, a hard time with the term rock, rock and roll. Like they think it's genre specific. Mm-hmm. I'm referring to rock and roll as just the blanket term for any edgy guitar music, punk, metal. I just say rock and roll because it's Coke. It's Coke right now. You know what I'm saying? Like you might be drinking a Dr. Pepper, but you know, the general term for it is Coke. You know, yeah. I know like I'm a huge hip hop fan too, and they ain't afraid of shit. Nope. Yeah. Like it's said, whatever is going on, it's said. One of the, one of the, so things- appreciative of that. You know, it's honesty. Like, yes. One of the things that we've talked about in this podcast several times is uh, a couple of things. I'm a big old school Ice Cube fan. I think I'm not sorry. Ice Cube. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Ice Cube. And then, you you know, you fast forward to NWA, fast forward to what Dr. Dre did and and the chronic. And the chronic is one of those moments in time. And I know it's not like in, in metal and like punk or whatever, but like. The Chronic is a very important album because it brought danger to like suburban white homes. And I think that was like a, a big deal. I, I think for, for what us at our age group, you know, that was, I was in elementary school when the Chronic came out or something like that. I think I was, and I, I hearing the Chronic, I was like, this feels like something my parents would not want me to listen to. This is totally. Not, yeah. And, I, and, and as it should be. Yeah. Right. And I remember thinking like, this feels like something I need to hide from my parents. Like, like I had just bought an ounce of Coke or something, you know, as a fourth grade, <laughs> like, but it felt that way. The, 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 out, the, the CD had a giant like weed leaf on it, you know, yeah. like it felt different than, you know, a, a Will Smith record or whatever, or whatever else is popular. Like this is not new kids on the block or something. This yeah. is, this is dangerous. Like the dude is like standing in front of a low rider on, on the CD gatefold and like, it looks dangerous. The dude's standing. It looks like he's in an alley in the middle of the night. This is not parent approved. Most of the songs are, you know, there's that, there's a song on there basically talking about the LA riots, which I had never heard about, like, you know, rapped about, sang about in a song where it's like, dude, this guy's talking about like discrimination and like, like violence in the streets. And like, you know, this is not what, what I was seeing, you know, no offense to like the Michael Jack, Michael Jackson's fun, but it's not like, it's not this, like, it's not like what I had been listening to on the radio. It's not Ace of Base or whatever. Like, this is, <laughs> this is different. Um, it, it felt dangerous and it made me like, and I've, I've said this a few times. I like it, that element of, I want to hear something like dangerous now. Like even to this day, I think it should be exciting. It should like music should always make you like at worst, it should bring out that Billy holiday element of, you know, like the, the, the mm-hmm. hanging, the hanging fruit element where it's just like, dude, you can, like strange fruit, fruit. like yeah like yeah like strange fruit like that song to me is like embodies like rock and roll i know it's not like a rock and roll song with a bunch of riffs but the passion and the fire in her voice and everything she's talking about and like the fact that it was like it usually was the last song she performed mm-hmm. where it was like hey if there's dudes cleaning dishes in the back everybody has to stop everybody has to stop and listen to this song and it's it's a song that like stands the test of time because we still see those things you still feel the aggression in her voice you feel the anger and like 
it still doesn't sit well with a lot of people for and it, that it's reason. a reflection of that underbelly i was talking about yeah and 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 like you hear rock bands now you hear like a band like disturb and they're heavy and they're loud and all these things but you're not saying anything like this shit is like the most like family friendly bullshit like slap this on a t-shirt and sell it a hot topic kind of kind of thing and it's like that to me that's yeah. not the element that i'm looking for in, in like rock yeah bands. yeah i mean go, let's go back to um ice cube for a minute yeah nwa scared the shit out of everybody like it was punk it was as punk as it was could get it was incredible but even more so i really like um death certificate which i think is ice cube's second solo release Mm -hmm. that record is a fucking masterpiece front to back every song the production the hooks the lyrics revisit that one and he really opens up on that one I mean, he oh, yeah. doesn't, he doesn't hold back and it's that in any, I think in any ice cube related project, that's my favorite by far. And um, introduced like that, like theatrical element too, like where those skits in between like songs and whatnot yeah. like, it really introduces yeah. that. It even introduced like, I like it too. Like, yeah, we said that, you know, rock music, that general term rock music should make your parents uncomfortable, but it should also make you uncomfortable. You know, me, I'm half white. You know, I grew up with a white mom. Mm-hmm. You know, he's very much talking about like, you know, I believe it's on death certificate or it might be on lethal injection as well, where he's talking about, you know, white cave bitch. And like, this is like very much where he's like going down that nation of Islam road. There's a, there's a lot of that on, I think both. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah both. Yeah. 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 Up until like he does like, you know, we be clubbing or whatever, like that was ice cubes. Like, you know, yeah is mantra right there is mo but um yeah it made me uncomfortable it's just like wait a minute like i'm not racist like i'm not this i'm not a you know as as a half white little boy or whatever i'm not <laughs> racist my mother's not racist but like it, it makes you aware like you were talking about with the chronic where it opens you up like oh here's what's going on from the right. other side of the aisle this is what we're going through this is our perspective and it's just like okay you know me you know how can i help bridge that gap you know it, it, it really opens you up to that which i appreciate as well let me ask you this michael um as uh as like time has progressed now you know the music scene has changed and you know the internet's changed a lot of things mm-hmm. um what what would you say is it a challenge because i have an idea of like you know there's bands i still find exciting like i, I i'm i'm huge on on uh, on this band death grips i, I love death grips i think yeah, they're, they're rad yeah, like to me, they are the next step of like, hey, this is dangerous, but it's like internet dangerous. Like, like you don't want your kids clicking on this link because they might be exposed to some like weird shit. And they totally embrace that element. Um, but like, you know, I see a lot of bands and bands that I I think are like, oh, this is gonna be exciting. And I see them live and it feels really tamed. I I don't even know what my question is really, but I guess like, what do you think is is the is that X factor that makes a band dangerous live? Because when I saw cunts live, I was like, this shit is dope, but there was like an X factor and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. It wasn't just the pantyhose on the head. It wasn't just something about it. It was, you know, like you guys are dripping sweat literally on the crowd and throwing your sweat on the crowd kind of thing. Like that's, that wasn't that. I mean, there were so many little X factors, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I was like, I don't know if obviously you guys don't rehearse that, but is there something that you try to embody in your live shows to, to add an element of danger? You know, I think that's a good question. If I can't put my finger on it either, then I have to say it's just being genuine. I don't know. Or genuine in the sense that, playing music like you get to like you're free you're you're tapped into this other thing that like therapy like getting it out well there's that too but um you're you're, you get to not be in reality for a little while you get to i mean yeah you got to play the set and play the songs right play the parts right and god i wish i could describe it better but for me especially in particular to those those shows you're talking about on that tour, I had just literally just come out of almost dying from cancer. Like I was just barely healthy enough to do that tour. And um, 
it's a weird thing, you know, where you're like, I don't give a fuck. Like, life is short and tomorrow is not guaranteed. And I am going to embrace this day and I'm going to tap into whatever inner for me. It's it's severe, like. PTSD and childhood trauma. That's music was the band aid for me. The first band aid was was music and skateboarding. Those are the things that saved my life through through youth, you know. Um, that though that was my therapy. So for me, playing live it, it, and granted, like the you know the planets all align and everything, it's a good show because um, just tapping into this thing, you don't know what it is, but like, and also just, I don't know, it just comes out. It just comes out, and you. And you're honest when you play, like you're telling the truth. I feel this way right now about this riff, about this song. I believe in this part. I believe in this song. Here it comes, you know, like that's the thing. Like early shows that I saw when you could tell they meant it. And you're just like, oh, my God. I am fucking buying that record right now. Who the fuck are these guys? Yeah. Like I saw so many shows like that, too. And I, and I I've, luckily, you know, being a little older, I caught a really good wave of, of music. The 90s, early 90s, like all the stuff coming from Seattle and the Midwest and Chicago, Jesus Lizard. Like there were so many bands that were so unique. And it was a really good time to be exposed to different people and different sounds and different but yeah, anyways, I'm rambling. But to go back to your question, so for cunts, I mean, we'd all been blown away by, like I said, bands like Cows and Hammerhead and Jesus Lizard and Shellac. And there was all, there was this era of music of really aggressive, edgy, pissed off music, you know, but it was good. Really, that's what it boils down to. Like, I think Quincy Jones always says this. There's only two kinds of music. It's fucking good or bad. That's yeah. it. You know, and those bands were so good. And when they played live, like you believed it. You're like, they're not, this isn't, yeah, it's it's a show, but I don't think these guys are faking any of this. Like, no. I, I remember seeing a few shows like that. I remember seeing a video of Flipper way back when. I was probably a little kid, but they were so fucked up. One of the members started crying while they were playing. Like it was legit. Like they were on the edge of killing themselves. And the other guy was throwing up on himself while they're playing. Like there was no faking it. Like they were fucked. And then one of those guys did die, you know? So there's that, there's that level of, of art, you know, like, I want to, honesty is fucking badass. I want to see it. Mm-hmm. Like, is it real? You know, does that make sense? Yeah, I- <laughs> it really does because, I mean, I listen to a lot of different podcasts and one of the podcasts I listened to, they were talking about like, there's four different types of people or whatever. And I'm not going to jump into all four of them, but one of them was just like, you know, they're, they're artists or whatever, right? Like you can't force an artist <laughs> to be another type of person. You know, they have to, you know, the way that they communicate is through the art, whether it's through painting, whether it's through stand-up comedy, whether it's through music, whatever, you know, like that's how they communicate. It's not conventional. And you can, I mean, you can relate to that because like when you said, like when you see an artist out there, you know, they might've sang the song a thousand times, but when you see them put every ounce of emotion into that lyric, into you know that movement or whatever, you're just like, oh, th- they're communicating something here, and yeah. you know that's the, like you said, the genuine, genuine added. Damn, I can't talk right now. The, it's okay. how, the genuinality of it or whatever. I'm gonna make up a word, all right? Fuck it, we'll do yeah, it. Live. Fuck it. Yeah, do it live. <laughs> do it live. Um, but authenticity. Yeah, like, authenticity. There you go. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, you see that and like that's their gift to the world right there you know you need all these different personalities because th- we all feed off each other we make up a bigger part of the puzzle and when I see an artist out there you know like you know give like Dillinger we were talking about Dillinger escape plan um, before we started recording 
seeing them live was just like holy shit like this is possible like they're not even on stage they're out in the crowd uh you know lead singer was like in the back of the room he was screaming into some you know buddy's ear or whatever and i was like this is badass like if i was to ever you know be more proficient at guitar like this is something that i would want to do because it's just like oh wow like this is the energy that i crave you know in a live show not you know like yeah, just sitting out there because it's just like there's so much more within me that it just has to burst out you know and right there it's just like i got it i clicked it's just like oh they're exercising their emotions right here i love yeah. it yeah it- and it's definitely not one of those things that you can rehearse. You can't plan for it. Uh, I mean, Dillinger is a good ex- example of that. A lot of the members of Dillinger, I think Greg from Dillinger can't even feel his hands anymore from like all the nerve damage from all the injuries he sustained during live performances and things like that. It's, it's very real. It's the element of danger of like throwing an amp over and like it might hit you. You got to get it out of the way. Like, you know, it's it's very very real like it, it's not planned it's not meant to hurt anyone but at the same time it is very much like this is the raw emotion like look out because this is what you came here for you came here for if you want if you it's not just the the scene elements and i th- I do think that you know the internet has added this like i just want to like post this on instagram and like here's a picture of me at a rock and roll show and it's it's not that like this is not some instagram worthy like thing this is very much the raw the the get ready to you know bleed on yourself and maybe end up with someone else's blood on you and someone else's sweat on you because it's very real like pre-corona time yeah well pre-corona <laughs> <laughs> but but it is it it does add that element to, to it that just can't be explained besides going back to like this primal element that we have in us you know maybe from the caveman days some just built-in dna element of us saying like that that is exciting the the danger is exciting you know like that is what attracts us to to controversial artists you know we talked about that album cover the cunts album cover it's one of my favorite album covers because it's so you know it's 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 cannibal corpish i guess in the sense that it's definitely meant to be vulgar but at the same time it's very much like you know meant to grab your attention like you know i talked about how like you know my mom's eyes focused on that we were like whoa like wh- what is this like this is intense <laughs> like like it, it is very much meant to like like raise some hairs and ask some questions and like put questions in your mind like should i listen to this like if you have no idea who this band is like that was one of my first experiences listening to to death grips i saw the uh no love no not not no love deep web it was um the money store album cover and and it's weird. It's like a, you know, a, a transgendered, um, uh, like gimp on the cover. And it's like, that's shocking. Like it, whether you think it's not, or it is or whatever, like when you see it on an album, you see like your Britney Spears album here and this album here and everything kind of looks the same. And then all of a sudden you see a, a transgendered, uh, gimp, you're just like, oh, okay, this might be a little different. I don't even know what this is. I just got to check it out. Let me hear one song because that is sh- a little bit shocking. It raises that attention level of like, this is making me want to listen to this. Yeah. So interesting. I, yeah. I, I hope that that element never goes away. It doesn't turn into like, here's a bunch of bands that sound like Coldplay or something. <laughs> Well, I don't know, you know, I think it, it goes, it goes in waves or it's cyclical rather, you know, and right now we're at a time where people are being really careful about everything they do. Yeah. It, we were talking about that before we started recording, um, about two episodes ago, we covered a topic, I, not even that controversial, but the focus of the topic is controversial i guess um i don't want to say it because i don't want to get this episode pulled or whatever but it ended up getting pulled down and our whole show almost got deleted you know entirely because by 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 uh youtube or uh Uh, the people that share our podcast oh okay yeah there's a a, like an umbrella yeah yeah so like the ones that the whole publish i don't know i don't who the supporting element to like let us put our podcasts on yeah on different um elements or basically okay. like this is too intense kind of thing yeah like a distributor like a yeah. distributor yeah. in a sense yeah. Yeah. correct yeah so they were gonna yank four years worth of doing this podcast off of the whole site or whatever just off of this one episode 
and it, it pisses you off because you're like, oh, fuck, man, like there's nothing really that controversial. Like we even like make a joke about it at the beginning of the episode, how like we're not against this person. We're actually for this person and whatnot. Right. We're doing we're taking the opposite route. We walked around eggshells or whatever, just presenting what it was or whatever. Right. You get pissed off because they want to take it down and whatnot and delete your whole show. And I get mad about that. But then I was like, at the same time, I get it because for so many years, the pendulum swung the other way, you know, where, you know, whatever you want to talk about. Right. You know, black people had to drink at separate drinking fountains and uh, we've you know, covered, white we've, people. I mean, when we had Justin on here, we talked about immigration and it got pretty intense. Like we've had some really like intense conversations on this podcast. Yeah. For that episode to get singled out and be like, we're going to take it down because you guys like hurt someone's feel i don't even know if like they ever heard the episode that's mm-hmm. but you know it's just like okay i gotta see it for the whole perspective right this pendulum was swinging so much far the other way for decades years centuries or whatever right like we were talking about with like the ice cube uh you know lethal injection and uh, death certificate albums and then it's swinging back the other way to the other extreme where it's like everybody's canceled you know like you know yeah the, you get your beasts that needed to be canceled like your harvey weinstein yeah yeah, yeah. And, like uh, who was the former owner of the Clippers, you know, that, you know, yeah, super yeah. racist or whatever. Yeah. Like we need to get rid of those, but now, you know, the pendulum is swinging so far up now that like everything that can be offensive, quote unquote, is getting canceled yeah. or whatever. Right. And so I was like, I get it. You know, eventually that pendulum is going to swing, hopefully, you know, in the middle to where it's not so extreme. So I wasn't where I sit with it now is just like, I'm not too upset. Cause I get it. It's not like I'm losing my house or losing any meals, you know, like obviously because of it. But at the same time, it's just like, wow, like this is the society we're living in now where it's just like you said, like every, everybody's kind of being safe right now because they have to be. Yeah. I, I was cool with it. I mean, it was one of those things that's like, I, this is not to like, talk about ourselves too much but it was kind of a little bit like yeah i'm kind of glad we're stepping on some toes because i don't want to just do like a yeah like shout out to k-man coffee and all that stuff like i know like if but i didn't i didn't want to do something that was just like here's the history of of pencil sharpeners or something like that like something that's just right right, right. yeah yeah here's, here's what i'll say i make music to keep from killing myself that's why I've always made music and art. It's, that's it. You know what I mean? I'm a fan of art. I need it. I need it to survive. Without it, I'll fucking not make it. You know what I mean? It's that simple for me. And all the other shit that's happening, I get it. I understand. You know, <clears throat> things need to change. Things change. All of that. And um, I'm going to keep making the style of music I make, you know, cause I, I have to, what else am I going to do? You know, does that make sense? It does, man. Honestly, that line you, you saying that fucking gave me chills, man. Like it's, it's intense. I mean it. and, and, and yeah. you, you've walked the line, like, you know, um, I don't know if this is like too intense to talk about, but you've talked about, you know, being a cancer survivor. I, uh, my mom battled cancer. She had breast cancer. I lost my dad to cancer. One of our best friends um, is dealing with, with cancer. Like it's, it's a very like real thing. And it's, it's one of the things that I take very, you know, personal. It's, you know, as a, as a child of two parents that have can have had cancer um, you know, the likelihood that one day might happen to me is is high. Like I'm aware of that. Like it's, Mm -hmm. and I, as you said that earlier about, you know, like, you you could barely do that tour you were barely healthy enough to do that cun story you were just you know at that level and you were like well fuck it like you know like let's do this i you know it is one of those things that i think you know, people should should embrace that element of tomorrow is not guaranteed if even if you're 100 percent healthy you could be fucking walking to work and bam you get hit by a bus or whatever mm-hmm. that element to me is and then the fact that you saying that is just like god damn like it the passion in your voice, everything you're saying to me just, just resonates truth to me. And it's just, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and I think it's very like inspiring that you're, you know, not only just working on one project, but you, as you said earlier, multiple projects and working and like putting everything you can into these projects. It, it is, it is a, a, an inspiration. And I thank you again for, for like 
even sharing that truth with us. I think it's beautiful, man. Absolutely. You're welcome. I mean, I was trying to find a picture for you right now of, of that time I shot, I finished a solo record or a solo EP before I was too sick to uh, work because of chemo and radiation. Um, the treatments almost killed me. But I was like, okay, I am going to do everything I can with the days I have left because I'm not sure I'm going to have any more. So I immediately like shot a, <laughs> shot a video, finished all like solo stuff. And I'm looking right now. Um, we lined up Dead Cross recording. I, I was so fucking sick and in so much pain recording that dead, the second Dead Cross record that isn't out yet. I'm looking at the pictures right now. I don't, I barely have my hair yet. I'm on, I was, you know what I mean? It's, 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 and I have other gnarly stories too. That wasn't the first time I escaped death, but uh, the perspective shift you get, you know, and um, yeah, holy shit, I look so old from the chemo and everything. Oh wow! wow. But there I am in the studio. It's like no, fuck that. Yeah. And I remember, um, and I had to get off while we were tracking that. I had to get off of the opiates I was on from the radiation from all the pain cold turkey oh. while we were recording and i i was just like i can do this i can do this i'm gonna do this i don't fucking care and then and then buzz asked if we wanted to do that tour you know and he's like are, you know provided you're healthy enough and he's like are you gonna be healthy enough i'm like fuck yeah let's go you know and so and then after that melvin's tour when we got home Justin and I did another recording project. I don't think it's going to see the light of day. It was just like an EP, but mm -hmm. um, that was uh, in March of 2020. Oh wow! And I got COVID right away. <laughs> oh my god! Wow. So I could I couldn't smell or taste anything for like ten months. Wow! I was like, really, motherfucker, dude! All for all for the sake of music and art, you know? But um. Yeah, I, what, what was my point? Sorry, I had a point. It's like, yeah, I, I'm gonna do this thing. I, what was it, Bukowski? And he's a horrible example, but um, find something you love and let it kill you. I think that I'm not sure if that was a Bukowski quote. I'm sure somebody will correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but uh, I get it. I get, like I said, provide like. Not a good example of someone to quote, but that quote, I fucking understand it 100%, you know? Yeah. Well, you could just go out, you know, with, you know, very, you know, mundanely, or you can do it doing the things that you love, you know? And like you, like Art was saying, like, you never know when you're, you're, you're going to, you know, this is, this is it kind of thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we lost two big stars recently. Um, it was easy top and, you know, and Slipknot I mean yeah. and I had the pleasure of seeing both in my life and I always tell all my friends this I remember um we saw um uh, Heaven and Hell uh Ronnie James Dio's version of Black Sabbath um as well as Motorhead um at the Samuel well, they episode. played together right? yeah. yeah and I was just like wow like this is amazing like who would have thought you know I would have been able to see these two amazing you know historical bands you know and then couple years later you know dio passes and, yeah you know lemmy passes and you're like holy shit you know and I, I always tell my friends like hey like whenever an opportunity comes to see you know these people to see them you know because you, you never know that's going to be your last one my biggest regret was um slayer and pantera actually came to bakersfield right uh, we didn't have to travel out of town or anything to go see them like they were right literally like right across the street from us and something happened where it's just like, Oh, I just want to stay in. I'm feeling whatever. Like, Oh, I'm sure I'll be able to see Pantera next year. Like literally that December, you know, Dimebag obviously passes away. 
And like, that's like one of my biggest guitar heroes right there. Just the way he played, like you were talking about, like, you know, the emotions or whatever, like one of my favorite guitar solos of all time is floods. I just love like how that song ends. I just love everything about that. Like there's no words to that fucking guitar solo, but I can understand every emotion that's in every note or whatever. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, to me, like, that's where it clicked. Like, as a young kid, like, maybe, like, 10 years old hearing that, it's just like, oh, wow, like, there's more to music than just, you know, like, you know, just dancing or whatever, right? Mm. And getting to see, like, you know, you know, ZZ Top, like, that's very much, like, something, like, my mom or dad would be into, but, like, uh, like understanding, like, oh, wow, like, this is, like, like, they're very much, that's their genre or whatever. They own, they bodied that whole genre or whatever, right? And then Slipknot, you know, taking the whole like new metal thing and then like making it into like the next generation of like hard metal, I guess you could say or whatever. And like Joe was a big part of that. You know, to me, it's like Slipknot, obviously David Gray passing or whatever, but like Joey, like that was like to me, like a driving force behind Slipknot. It's just like to have him gone. It's just like, oh, wow. Like that is a, to me, a huge loss to like the music community as a whole. Yeah, man, that's 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 pretty wild. Like you know, losing those those uh those uh huge names in music that's a, a pretty intense blow to any like music fan. Whether you're a Slipknot fan or a CZ Top fan or whatever it may be, like you know, I was pretty young when I first heard Slipknot. It did it did get me into harder music. Like you know, I I, I remember that time period. I actually I I heard. Dillinger for the first time it was like the first time I heard anything where he's like the dude's just screaming the whole time and like Blood Brothers and the Locust and things like that that I was like oh shit like there's like faster paced music out here that I'm just like not even being exposed to like all of a sudden I was like not interested in like radio shit anymore and like I wanted to go down these like you know deeper darker roads um but yeah I mean it's to to tie in you know what both of you guys said right now like you know you brought up Bukowski and one of my favorite quotes of his, I think it says it on his gravestone. It just says, don't try. And, and I think to me, it's, to me, it's like, you could take that however you want, but I, I think that it's it. the reason I think that that quote and putting that on your, on your gravestone is beautiful. is just because it's like, you know, there are things that just should come naturally to you in like passion. Like if you're trying to fake it, if you try to, I want to be this and it's just not who you are, you're trying, it's not natural to you. It's not a, it's not a natural thing. Don't try, just do. Yeah, there, there are natural things that should just come to you that are just like, dude, you talk about music where it's just like, that just sounds like something that's just in your DNA. Like, you know. Like eating or breathing. I, I think, you know, I, I've done, we've we've both been on other people's podcasts and things like that. And like, I think that there's times that it's just, it's not the same flow. It's not the same passion where it's just like, although I respect everything they're doing, the, the energy and everything, sometimes I'm just like, like the fact that we kind of deviate and we kind of give ourselves that element of jazz of like, you know what? Like, fuck it. Like, Oh, this conversation is going this way now. Like, dude, let's go down that road. That's fine. Like, fuck it. Like we're, we'll go, go down that road. Like that element of don't try Like, it's just, just, we're not trying to like fit it into some little box. that's going to work. It's, you know, like, no, it's cool. It's, it's fine where it's going. Like um, that element always like really, really like resonates to me where it's just like, you know, whatever your whatever plan you have in life like life doesn't care about your plan like <laughs> it's it's all about like what you're gonna fucking do with it now like mm. that to me is like the the beauty of it yeah how you make your chicken sa- sa- how you make your chicken salad out of the chicken shit that you're dope <laughs> yeah. i love chicken salad it's great that sounds delicious <laughs> chicken right now, salad is uh, <laughs> pretty good mm. Uh, I would like to talk about a few of of your favorite albums. Uh, I mean, we talked about the CZ Top album where we were discussing the the whole putting this out podcast together. So I do want to touch on that. One of the yep. things I wanted to talk about really quickly was I can see you have a Slayer tattoo on your arm. Yep. Um, and I would just I'd love to hear you know how Slayer influenced you or you know how it. I mean, obviously to get it tattooed on your arm, it has to mean something. So I don't know if you have any like introduction to slayer or how you got into slayer or whatever because i think we're both fans of slayer and that's one of those bands that we really respect and love um i mean i'll say this number one uh music being a religion right especially metal it's such a religion it's so personal 
And um, it's almost like a higher power for a lot of people. And it was for me for so long, especially like metal, you know. Um, but Slayer, I got, what was the first, the first time I heard Slayer, I w- would have been, it had to have been maybe like 1990, 91, maybe 1990. And um, I was jamming with a drummer trying to start a band <clears throat> and he was really into them. And he, and he played me Angel of Death. And I was like, whoa, that fucking double kick drum solo. You know, I don't know what, I never asked Dave if it'd be considered like a bridge or a drum solo or just a break, <laughs> you know, but I remember that to me, I was just like, that's different. I haven't heard anyone do that before, you know? And then from then on, I was just like, whoa, these guys are fucking gnarly. And I think the first tape I had was Show No Mercy, which is totally different. You know, I don't think Rick Rubin wasn't involved. They didn't have that, that sound then. But it was still, you could tell they were fucking good. The songs are good. Like, everything's good. And I was just like, damn, I like this shit, dude. I was already really heavy into Metallica. I was into Metallica first. Obviously, they were a lot bigger back then. And um, and I think the first Metallica I was into, like really into, would have been Injustice for All because it had just come out, or they were just releasing it. They were releasing the singles, the cassettes mm-hmm. that had a single and a B side of a cover. And um, on the B side of one is uh, the Prince, which is a Diamond Head song. And I was just like, these guys are fucking rip holy shit they are so tight and so fast and so precise with so much swing you know but then so slayer was um that helped me get into slayer you know obviously you're just exposed to that world now of thrash i guess like thrash metal yeah with the kick kick on the down and the snare on the up you know and um and then I, I re- oh, it was um, Seasons in the Abyss, 92, I think that came out, maybe? 91, I think. It was it 91? Yeah. But I remember that came out. My friend had the cassette, and we were in, like, remedial math class in high school. And I was just like, Pff. I listened to that tape nonstop, front to back, over and over and over and some would say that that's their most, like their best record. It's probably the most polished, maybe, as far as songwriting. Um, like Skeletons of Society and all those songs. It's like, dude, this shit is, it's so good. It's so perfect. Like the riffs, really. And the vocal placement over the riffs. And like the swing, the natural swing, how the songs pop, you know? Like they fucking pop. Slayer songs pop, man. When they're in the pocket, they are in it. Yeah. But more than that, like, and I remember my dad's, uh, my dad has always played in bands. My parents are really young. And um, my, I remember my dad's uh, bandmates. And, and some of them were, they were like, they come from that era of, of like Steely Dan and Foreigner and like an emphasis on playing and songwriting. And so they were always really snobby, like highbrow motherfuckers. And, um, and I remember they heard that and they're just like, Whoa, who's the drummer? (laughs) Like they were all so blown away that someone could play that fast. Yeah. You know, with, and Dave has such a signature style, you know, that really behind the beat, like it's just fucking so incredible mixed in with metal. Um, so that was my introduction into Slayer. Oh, and then so there is significance, obviously. Like I said, metal just represents its freedom, you know. Mm-hmm. It's so it describes how you feel, mm-hmm. it gets it, it understands, it welcomes you in and gives you a hug, you know. It's it's a, it's a big hug, like it's gonna be okay, yeah. That's that's it. 
I had a teacher, um, a music teacher in college. Um, it was a world music class or whatever. So we had to hear like, you know, music from like all around the world, you know, like Africa, Ireland, Italy, like all these like, you know, traditional musics or whatever. But then like, you know, towards the end of like every class, like he would just, you know, talk to somebody, you know, randomly in the class and be like, hey, so what music are you into? And, you know, some girl would be like, oh, I'm into Britney Spears right now. And, you know, we'll, yeah. you know hear him talk about that. And it's like, oh, that's cool. And you'd like, well, what, what makes you like Britney Spears? Well, I just like the way she talks about this. I can relate and whatever. Right. And then there was like a couple other metalheads, like in that this class or whatever. And there was a kid like he always came in with like a children of Bodom uh, shirt. And he, he went to him and he was just like you know okay like you know you look like you're, you're into that heavy duty stuff and uh he was you know asking about that you know why he loves that band and whatnot and he was like that's interesting and he goes let me ask you something and he goes um how how's your home life not to get too you know you know personal or whatever like is it good bad you know so so you don't have to get too personal or whatever and he was like yeah he goes yeah and he goes, that's, that's the thing, like, with metal, it's just, like, it's the generation that, you know, why metal was so big during that generation is because, you know, their parents, you know, it's a lot of the fathers, you know, they're dealing with, like, their own PTSD from, like, war, so, like, they're silently, you know, suffering in silence, you know, those parents or whatever, you know, the marriage isn't always as great or whatever, so naturally, the children kind of suffer, they don't get as much, you know, love, and, you know, they're kind of emotionally neglected, so, you know, they gravitated towards this music that was yelling not at them, but with them. Art, you know, has said that quote as well. But um, I thought that was like an interesting concept because like when you really think about it, you're like, huh, yeah, that this is this is a genre of music that's speaking to what they're going through. And yeah, yeah, it's loud, it's fast, it's angry. And, you know, Iron Maiden is throwing pictures of, you know, Eddie, you know, playing with the devil or you know, I, you know, Motley Crue, you know, they got a whole pentagram on there or whatever is because like, Hey, like, Hey, pa like pay attention parents. Like, Hey, I am, I'm suffering over here too, as well, because of, you know, whatever you guys are going through, I'm mm -hmm. suffering because of that as well. So like, Hey, like it's not shouting at me, it's shouting with me. And like, I've always, ever since like mm -hmm. I heard that, like, it's just like, yeah, it makes total sense. You know, like, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I grew up like in a single mother household. So my mom was always busy so naturally i gravitated towards gangster rap and heavy metal because yeah. it's just like hey like emotionally you know you're, you're a little neglected you know what i'm saying you don't have like that little house on the prairie family unit or whatever that's you know i look at you know other friends like who had like you know the perfect you know nuclear family like with the father and the mother very much involved they weren't in the heavy metal music they were in you know to mm -hmm pop punk or you know something you know very safe or whatever but like i was over here this black sheep you know listening to fucking black sabbath or fucking venom or whatever right and that that very much resonated it was like oh shoot you know i'm looking at something that's that's supporting my emotions right now yeah yeah i mean i i, I yeah i agree with you i mean we that's one of those things that we've talked about that metal does that like early on gangster rap does that like when you see someone who is a, a metalhead and you you see the slayer shirt and you see the tattoo like you just know that you're in the same like like fraternity you, you, you get it like there's a little bit of a brother unspoken brotherhood and in my and, and i'm not saying every metal band is the same way like there's metal bands out there that i think are just disposable and this is horrible this is some like like hot topic shout out to hot topic but like you know like it's it's disposable it's radio rock like this is not dangerous that element of danger is not there like there's there's bands that are just like you know talking about like fucking zombies or whatever like or whatever you know we were talking make fun of uh disturb on on uh, one time but uh you know like not to pick on disturb like but like but there is that disposable element of it but Yes, there is like I think a Slayer where a Slayer goes and not that Slayer was mainstream ever, but like Slayer is huge. Like, you know, like they were able to to captivate an audience and still like you look at Slayer pits when they're playing humongous shows and that shit looks brutal. Like there it is not meant for um some like you know this is not getting played at uh well let's put it this way anytime like rain and blood plays there's always something <laughs> popping up when that song yeah fucking hits. I, I think i think was it i i saw i saw the misfits play one time and i can't remember who their opening band was um uh, but they played raining blood as it was I, did we see that together yeah. we saw that together right they played raining blood and as soon as they played raining blood the pit erupted like it was it went from being like an okay pit to like 
the biggest circle pit like of the night just because raining blood was playing and it was just like dude this is what is up like this is this is that element that it's in our dna it's our tribal i I, i've always felt that where it's just like you got to connect to that tribal anger sometimes if it's anger or whatever it is like i think that that's just built into our dna to to express that yeah it's controlled though too because it's like hey somebody falls down you pick them up whatever it's never you know unless it's woodstock 99 (laughs) <laughs> it's controlled but at the same time like there is that element of danger that you could break an arm you could cut yourself you could you know whatever like there, there is that element that's just it's not all safe and that's the element of the excitement too like there is that yeah yeah no i agree sorry i gotta i gotta go into a different room hang on a second oh no worries no problem man Yeah. So is it what we were going to talk a few records, right? Did yeah, we wanna... yeah. 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 I mean, most specifically, you know, you had brought up the, uh, the CZ top album, the, the Tres Ombres album. Yes. And, um, I listened to that album. It's been a long time since I, uh, since I had actually heard that album, but I listened to that album a few days ago in its entirety after you brought that up. And I was, I was telling this guy, I was like, wow, I, I didn't realize how, like, you said it was Texas rock. I said it was, like, like blues meets, like, southern rock. And I was like, the fact that it was difficult to even put my finger on what it was was cool to me. Yeah. That it was CZ Top Rock. Like, it was, don't even put a label on it, just CZ Top Rock was what I was, like, Well, yeah, thinking. I mean, they bodied that genre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that was the record we decided, like, after – after Dusty died, or um, you know what I mean? I was like, shit, we should probably talk about something more specific right now or something that really, I don't know. But that record, like, so again, like my dad and was always in the band. There's always music around me. My mom was really into disco and Motown. So I got that whole world from her. And which I am equally a fan of as much as metal or rock. But um, so with that particular ZZ Top record, um, there's a few songs, um, Master of Sparks, Chic, obviously LaGrange, but Precious and Grace is I think the best, that one. Queens of the Stone Age did a cover of it too. Yeah. Um, And this kind of ties into what you're saying. There's so many different descriptions of this genre of these genres. Like there was Texas boogie. There's all the Southern rock. You know, it's just fucking badass. Mm -hmm. You know, like those riffs. What's that? The musicianship too. And I was telling this guy, I was like, I believe Billy Gibb before. Obviously, you know, Jimi Hendrix passed away. I believe that was Jimi Hendrix's favorite guitar player. I remember hearing that. He was one of them, yeah. Yeah. He was one of them. Yeah, that was uh, when I told Jacob, I was like, yeah, I think we're I think we're going to go with Tress Somers as the album. It, Jake, he replied back. I was like, dude, that's super interesting right off the bat. I was like, <laughs> yeah. wow. Like, yeah, that's always like when you hear that, you're like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. That's got to mean Sold. something. But But like, so that song in particular, like, and a lot of a lot of his songs or uh, their songs, but um, like the 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 vocal placement over the riffs, like the how the song pops, you know what I mean? Like those songs are fucking sick. Mm-hmm. Like his vocal placement, that's so difficult, and a lot of people don't realize that singing and playing at the same time, where yep. you put the words, where you the syllables and everything, and how they flow. <laughs> Like that's the shit, dude. That's the natural. That's a natural. You have a natural ear. Two and, sides of your brain are working at the same time, yeah. which is super difficult. Yeah, I've I've told this guy a million times. Like, I, that's why I was always just like a rhythm guitar player. Like whenever I played, because it's just like, don't ask me to sing, because I'm gonna fuck some shit up. Because it's mm-hmm. like you're so in, you know, in tune to what you're playing. It's just like, okay, now I got to do something else. And like you were saying, like, okay, if it's off of the 
you know, what I'm playing or whatever right here. Like if I have to do something different, like something's got to stop, you know, either I got to stop playing and just sing or, you know, I'm just playing, like I'm not singing at all. Yeah. And like you're, you're absolutely right with that. Yeah. It took me back on that. Um, another person who doesn't get enough credit for that is James Hetfield, who is a motherfucker of a guitar player. Yes. Singer at the same time. Oh yes. So, but yeah, so that record, really uh, was one of the many in, in 70s rock that I'm still, I still listen to and I love. Um, Robin Trower, Bridge of Sighs is another one of my favorite records. That record's so good. That guy was a fucking gnarly guitar player. Um, like Joe Walsh solo. Um, uh, what else? Thin Lizzy. Like any any of that era of rock, you know, mm-hmm. the songs are just fucking cool. Mm-hmm. Like that's it, and and I love it when something sounds, um, when when the sounds are so, when it becomes so visceral, so I can picture what it all when it, when a song paints a picture for me, you know, when it's so connected. Um, when you, for example, when I hear like that song, Precious and Grace off that record or any, no, any of the songs off of Bridge of Sides from Robin Trower, like I picture like whiskey and fucking <laughs> a pile of cocaine <laughs> and it smells like cigarettes Yeah, and there's bikes, like bikers. I picture 70s bikers. Yeah. In the valley. Like I can see it, I can feel it, I hear it, all of it. Smell it, everything, yeah. I love it when 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 a song does that, like when it can teleport you to a time and a place. Like um a lot of butthole surfer songs. I'm like I'm a huge fan. I'm like, this sounds like a lot of the drugs I did. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like yeah, this yeah. sounds exactly like what it felt like when I was co- coming to after a heroin fucking binge or smoking crack or doing speed for three days. This is exactly how it sounds. Yeah. What's so. crazy is like when it can do that and you haven't even experienced those substances yet, like. For example, my mom, like she was very much like a child of the 70s. So like before she got like all super Christian, like I heard all of those records like growing up, you know, whether it be Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, you know, ABBA, like shout out to ABBA. I love that fucking band. But um, um, Van Halen, just like all that shit. Right. And so one band like I always gravitated towards was uh, Pink Floyd. And I remember as a kid, you know, before, you know, I had ever, you know, partook in marijuana. Um, I was like, man, this is probably what it's like to get high. Like, I don't know. I've never, obviously I'm just a child or whatever. Like I've never experienced the head change before, but I imagine like, this is probably what it, what it's like or whatever. Right. And the first time I ever got high, I was like, yeah, this is, this is dark side of the moon. Like, yeah, this is totally (laughs) right here or the beginning of fucking wish you were here. Like all of that. Like, it was just like, oh wow. Like, so to me, like to piggyback off of what you're saying, like, when an artist does a really good job, when you never even partook in that and you can already picture it, like you're like, holy shit. Like that's, that's amazing right there. That's other, that's otherworldly. That's godly. Yeah. I I did partake in all those substances. (laughs) So I can tell you with absolute certainty that that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Dude. I, as much as I agree with you, I, uh, once I started smoking weed, I, I had to go back and re-listen to a bunch of those trippy albums, those like nineteen seventies albums. I was like, I had to go re-listen, get high, and re-listen oh, to yeah. every album. I was like, this is so much better. I that was like, senior I, I year hate, of high school. I, like I, I was like, do you want to go to a football game? No, I'm gonna smoke weed and listen to some seventies. I, I rock. used to be the the person that's like, no, I love music on a deep level. Getting high won't do it. Like, there's no way it can get better than this. I I'm one hundred percent connected to the music right now. I was I don't need drugs to do that. And then like once I started smoking weed, I was like, oh my God, weed makes this so much better. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you a quick funny story. Um 
I had done, I had already done acid and uh, mushrooms, but this one time we got, uh, so my friend had a cafe on Venice and God, I want to say right by, right by Sepulveda, right by the 405. It was called the Soko Cafe. And he was super into fucking power violence and all that kind of meat. Like he, he, he had rad taste. And, um, but so it was a collective. We would all hang out there and play guitars and music and art and coffee and politics. And it was a rad place. But so we went for, we, we were going to get a beer and we went to the 7-Eleven over there. And um, I was with this dude who was a tagger, kind of like a tag banger type. And he was going into 7-Eleven and two cops were walking out, undercover cops, but you could tell they were cops. And they stopped him and they were talking for a while. And we were like, whoa, what the fuck, dude? Like, I wonder if he's getting arrested. And then he came back to the car all excited. And we're like, what was that all about? He's like, no, I grew up with one of those dudes. He goes, you guys want to do some acid? They just gave me some acid. And I was like, no (laughs) fucking way. The cops gave you acid, LAPD. He's like, yeah. And so it was... Like I had never done like real acid. That shit was so fucking powerful. It cleaned our clocks. I mean, that was the first time I'd ever didn't know my name, where I was, who I was, or my purpose in life. Like you, I got zapped, like you get erased. Thank God, you know, but so we ended up on Santa Monica beach because we couldn't drive the car anymore. Like we, it was kicking in and we were fucked. We weren't even on this planet. And we sat on the beach and just watched colors. I was literally in a cartoon. And um, right before we got on the beach in the, in the car, I, um, I don't remember whose car it was, maybe his, but we had Sonic Youth, Confusion is Sex. And you put it in and I was like, Take, take it out. It's eating the tape. It's eating the tape. And he's like, no, it's not. I'm like, it's eating the tape. He's like, that's how the song sounds. And I was like, oh my God. And then we listened to it more that night, you know, and it just sounded so fucked and crazy. And then I sober after, you know, after the acid wore off and everything, listening to it again, I was like, oh my God. How'd these guys do that? Because that record sounds like a fucked up acid trip. Yeah. Like where things are out of tune and just the production is weird and over here and then over here. I was like, God damn, that's so early Sonic Youth is a great example of um mm. Sonic Youth does that a lot of times, like um, even like um is it on goo? Where uh, I think cool thing the, the the song before cool thing sounds like it's about to go into cool thing and then the song just ends and then cool thing starts up again and you think something fucked up on your radio and it's like, dude, they I don't know if they actually thought these things out or if it was just that, happy accidents. Uh-huh. That might have been for another reason. When you master an album, you master it. Um, they have what's called the vinyl split. You got to cut the songs at mm-hmm. certain times so it depends on the it depends on what format you listen to it on so oh. if, so if, if it was digital it was mastered for vinyl or cassette where it did just go into the next song but digitally or something it's going to stop and then restart and then the time starts oh okay so that could have been that or it could have just been genius yeah, we'll I leave mean, it at I- that I've always thought like Open that's for one of interpretation. Those, yeah, I, I think samples like always trip me out. Um, not that it's at that level of like high story, but I remember my my buddy TJ. He was um doing like this like internship thing for like NASA, and uh, he was he used to take acid all the time, <laughs> and um, I didn't know this. He I, he I don't think he knew this, but I guess acid stays in your system like it stays in your spinal cord, and um. He was in the middle of doing this NASA testing and he like leaned back to like stretch his back. And I guess it like popped his back a little bit and then re-released into his system. Oh, wow. 
and he was like tripping balls and he, he said that like it looked like the letters were falling off of the paper and he was like oh shit like he was trying to gather it all back up on the paper like spaghettios or what <laughs> yeah he was just like he couldn't That's he didn't awesome. know what he didn't know what had happened. I remember we like met up with him after and he was like still like super pale and sweaty. And you know, I was like, what happened? And That's he's trippy. Yeah. And he was like, dude, I, I didn't know it stayed in my system. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've heard that, that uh, tale before too. I, I, that never happened to me. I certainly tried, but I was never that lucky to have a, a, a good um, flashback. Have a chiropractor pop you a certain way. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's like doing um, it in the middle of yoga and pff, oh shit. Uh, but yeah, so I guess to kind of um, con- wrap it up, I those those um, those seventies era records uh, as a guitarist and a singer and just I like writing songs were always so well written and so well produced and most seventies music in general is fucking so good the songwriting is flawless um the arrangements are flawless the choruses the verses the bridges intros outros solos um you can learn a lot as a songwriter if you go back and listen to 70s uh radio 70s am fm soft rock or hard rock like there, there were a lot of work was put into how those songs were were produced let me ask you this question because it's something uh, me and one of my uncles have talked about quite a few times because he's very much he's in love with music just like I am. And I'll get into my theory, whatever. But you said that you were in L.A. When did you come to L.A. or w- were you born and raised in L.A.? I was born in Cadillac, Michigan in 1974. And then I moved around a lot. OK, you know, I can't remember the timeline of my life. But my mom and I came to California in 1978 to San Jose was the first place we went the bay area or i don't know if san jose is really the bay area but uh palo alto san jose um, sunnyvale i think yeah um so i was four years old and we lived up there for a while i moved back around a while i think to michigan again back my dad settled in los angeles so most of my years were uh, in los angeles in the valley okay. growing up yeah, because my my family they originally are from L.A. Um, on both sides, my dad and my mom's side, and um, my uncle he said when he was growing up, uh, they very much like the California public school system. They very much uh, had a focus on the arts. Like there was more money, you know, for you know mm. things like music education and you know music appreciation. Like where like his you know younger brother my other uncle like he didn't give a shit about music but like he knew how to read music because that was just taught in the public school system and he said that it's his theory that you know once you know politics got involved reagan you know gains more power he started yeah yeah money out the of, reagan era yeah mm-hmm. they take money out you know from the arts they took money out of you know school system for you know things like that and reagan you know, took money from anyone poor and he said that, you know, that's why you saw like in the 70s, you know, in the 60s that, you know, there was this influx of like really good music because a lot of people were like music literate, you know, like, you know, art people that were just natural proteges, like they already had that built into their DNA huh. from a young age. And I've always wanted to follow up with like that theory because you do see like, okay, generally, okay, then in the 80s like you still see you know great music being made but as time has gone out i'm not trying to talk shit like on you know this new generation of music but you do see that there's a drop off it's become more simplistic which is fine you know i mean everything doesn't have to be you know a eight minute you know epic song or whatever with you know drum solo bass solo and all this stuff i love that stuff but it doesn't always have to be that but you do see like a drop off of that as a as a result of, you know, you know, music programs being taken away from yeah. public education. I mean, I'm, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know. I, I didn't learn any music in school. It was all I did in the Los Angeles public school system was ditch <laughs> <laughs> and skateboard and, and okay. just skated and, and played punk rock and metal. Yeah. So the LA public school, public school system was great for that. It really did. Um, and maybe some of what you're describing too is also 
um, like a stylistic thing. It could be just a, a genre mm-hmm. style. Um, like with hip hop and all the trap and how it's, it's really stripped down, you know, and, and even their delivery, like even the delivery of it is becoming really uniform. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just the sound. So like, there's always a, a particular sound that's really popular or, it, it, you know, there's so many, there's so many sub genres of metal slam gent, there's all kinds of, so it, who knows? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Who knows it's what a, inspires it. Shout out to my uncle Robbie for that theory, but I always thought that was interesting. It's always one of those things. It could be right. Yeah, could be I right. just, I think one of the things that's like really interesting is in, in the seventies, and I think most musics when they're in in their infant stages, in the seventies, I think rock was still in a very, you know, I'd been around, but not to that level. Like, I think musicians had to really practice and practice like getting the vocal harmonies getting these things right and it was all on them there wasn't any post-production we're not going to auto-tune this thing we're not going to pitch correct we're not going to do any of that stuff like it's it's on you just being a really good singer and getting the right take and being a good producer and all these things and even going to rap like you know there's that iced tea rap was like six in the morning cops that was there's a knock on my door like you just knew the rap because it was just wrapped in this very like precise way that was just like not that you don't hear that so much in rap, but like that now it's like you listen to a rapper and it's very produced and it's very shiny. It's very gimmicky. And it's like, you know, it sounds like every rapper kind of sounds like Drake or a variation of Drake. And it's just like, uh, it's not the same. It's not, it's not the same element anymore because that practice isn't there anymore. Like just figuring out these flows and these raps. And there's a, there's a reason why like, you know, doggy style and the chronic are so like quotable and re-rappable and you can rap along with it and it still stands the test of time because you know like those lines the way that you know snoop dogg had to change his delivery like you know that was well thought out now it's like you could put it like i'm sure drake has a new album coming out next week or something you know like it's it's just so easy to put it all out there well to that point too like on the chronic there's that there's a song on there called d's nuts And for years, I've always thought like, you know, when you put on the right headphones, like you're always hearing like a new sound because there's like eight, nine, ten different layers on in that song. And uh, the song Closer by Nine Inch Nails kind of does the same thing, too. But I always like appreciate the shit out of that. And it's like like I was saying, like nowadays, you you don't really hear that too much anymore. Where That's that's one of those things that that makes like an album like like Tress Ombre is like so special. that You hear it and you hear like the you talked about the the left and right brain, the guitar work and the, his vocal delivery. And it's like, dang, that's, that's really, it's all really special the way it all just sounds. And it's, it, it sounds like you can hear the room. Like you can hear these kind of like, maybe like dusty countertop to a bar that probably <laughs> like sells meth in the back or something like the movie Desperado. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. No, Totally. But yeah. Well, Michael, um, I do want to thank you for coming on, man. I, thanks for having me, man. Anytime. I, I love to talk. If you we ever want to come music anytime. If you, you ever know. want to come on and talk Reaganomics, uh <laughs> I'm down to talk some Reaganomics. I, I uh that yet. motherfucker, man. I remember that era when he took office because my mom so my mom had me when she was 19. And we were on food stamps and welfare and everything. And, and I remember very clearly going to the supermarket one afternoon after she got off work and I was like, mom, can we get that? Mom, can we get this? She's like, we can't, we can't afford it now. Cause they cut, they cut, uh, they cut what we were getting. She's like, they cut my stamps. And I was like, what does that mean? And then later you learn. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We'll save that for another time, but yeah, I remember yeah, no, very no, clearly. I- We'll pencil that, that one in. That sounds you. like a, pencil like a that topic, in. yeah. Yeah, we just did an episode about televangelism. And it was Ugh. funny because Reagan comes up a lot, like, when I was doing my research on that episode. And it's like, wow, that's super interesting that, like, I be- there was one thing real quick, and we- we'll wrap it up, I promise, okay. uh, where uh, Reagan, I guess, like, like abortion like is a big thing, you know, for conservatives or whatever. Like, we got we to gotta repeal Roe versus Wade. 
and uh, Reagan at one point when he was governor of California, and he he actually like signed some law that was very supportive of like abortion rights or whatever. But once like the televangelists got a hold of him, like he started like going down like that path of like fucking you know Jerry Falwell, like oh yeah, he's a fucking puppet man. Like, yeah, that's all that. Yeah, guy. they're all together. Yeah. 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 All right, we'll save that for next time. Hell yeah! So thank you again, Michael. Yeah, thanks for having me, you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a All great right. day, sir. Okay, thank you. Right. Later. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, everybody. Uh, we are still recording on our end. We're just going to wrap that up. Art, thank you for bringing him on. I believe I suggested, like, the Olympic bombing. And... Let's talk about some Olympic bombings. Really. No. <laughs> no, I mean, the the guy I, I think is uh, – I, I didn't want to just have him on here because, you know, here's a a famous face or whatever, mm-hmm. like – um, I, uh, I really believe in like what he does and like, you know, cunts is a special band. And, and I know it sounds like probably not a band that you've heard of a lot of times. Maybe you've heard of dead crosses, dead crosses has Mike Patton and, uh, Tom Lombard, David Lombardo. Yeah. And like, you know, that's a, that's one of his bigger bands, but like, or, or you know, you know, retox with, with Justin and from the locust and all that stuff and the locust and, um, yeah, I don't know. I think he's a. I think he's a. Seems like such a genuine human being. You see him play. You see him. You see his passion. That line of him saying like, "I music," I think he says, "Music keeps me alive." Or yeah. That I mean, it's it's honest. It's felt honest as he said it, and I was like, "God damn!" Like, That's a true this, artist right there. It is a true artist, and yeah. like that that was bad that was more badass than i thought it was gonna be like he just seems like a chill ass dude yeah those are the type of people like you want in your life kind of thing like there's there's no agenda just other than like he's just trying to stay true to himself i i appreciate that it's like he's like a son you can't help but be attracted to like that energy so uh shout out to him michael cream oh we didn't do the whole social media thing but you can follow him just- oh guys yeah i mean you every band that i've said right now like dead crosses i'm sure they'll be on some festival i mean it's <laughs> they're not nobodies on that one um but like cunts like that illegal underground show that he was talking about that sounds super exciting look out for that if you live in the southern california la area like dude that they are definitely a, a band to like watch and like see like what they're doing because they're fun it's exciting it, it brings that excitement of, of of like what's going on here but yeah that's all I got. Tell your mommy you with two shallows. The Jackman shallows are boring. <laughs> and if you want to follow us on all the social medias and see what we're up to and probably see some clips of this episode, um, go ahead and follow us on all the social medias at Art and Jacob Do America. Except for Twitter, we are at Art and Jacob Do A1. I won't make an A1 hot, uh, steak sauce reference because Jordan from Words Are Hard podcast was giving me shit about that. Oh really? Yeah. Well, yeah, not like in a mean way, but what? No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Dude, I'm like, sta- I can't, I can't stop staring at my finger. I have like a shard of metal stuck in my finger right now, and it's just, I can't help. It, like, I mess with it, it, hurts a little bit, but it's like just a little bit of pain. That's like, oh, it's okay. Pain for pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of pain for pleasure, guys, make sure uh, you go to RT Public and um, check out some of our merch that helps support the podcast, as well as check us out. Uh, the Podbelly Network. Oh man, I blinked out there for yeah, a second. Yeah. My bad. I fucking had uh, fucking oxygen escape my yeah, brain or yeah. whatever. Uh, but yes, we are part of the Podbelly Network. So if you like this podcast, you want to hear other great podcasts similar to us, if not better, uh, guys, check out the world famous Sofa King podcast. My homeboy Eddie, who does very similar podcasts to what we just did right now um, at the RRBG podcast. Um, I highly recommend listening to uh, uh, the Ben Weinman episode uh, from Dillinger. I just checked that out um, last night while I had some time. It's kind of a response to his Aaron North episode that he did. They kind of provide some perspective on their their fallout and friendship. Super interesting guy. Super interesting episode. Check that out. As well as if you want to hear some like paranormal shit, you know, check out Paranormal Punchers or Hillbilly Horror Stories. But other than that, guys, great episode. We'll talk to you next week. Guys, have a good night.